coming up today on LinkedIn News Live. How will work look different post-COVID-19? McKinsey Global Institute just released a series of reports that explore the pandemic's long-term impact on the economy. The co-author of that report will tell us the industries that'll see growth and the ones that will be changed forever. Plus, new LinkedIn data shows why people are staying in their current jobs and how job seekers are stepping up. All that next. Hello, I'm Caroline Fairchild, and welcome to LinkedIn News Live, where the business conversation begins with you. It's February 18th, and here's a quick look at the top headlines trending right now on LinkedIn. Millions in Texas still without power. U.S. life expectancy drops by a year and more Americans sheltering in job. Let's take a deeper look into that story. Ambition isn't dead, but for people with steady work, ambition is hibernating. Insights drawn from a survey of thousands of LinkedIn members show that the top reason people are staying in their current roles is because they are sheltering in job. Joining me now to discuss is senior editor at large, George Anders. George, at, at some point in this pandemic, we've all sheltered in place, but sheltering in job, what is that? So it's very parallel to sheltering in place. And what's happening is people are saying, you know what, there may be another year where I'm gonna look for a promotion, where I'm gonna take my game up a level. Right now, I'm just glad to have the paycheck. Uh, I use the money to keep my finances in order. I might be too tired to go job hunting. I might feel that the economy's too weak. I'm just gonna kind of stay where I am. And is this because people are more unhappy at work right now? Is this just general COVID malaise about people thinking about work in terms of just everything that's going on around them is not a priority in terms of switching jobs? So you've got a lot of factors and everything you identified is a big part of it. I think the other thing is just the economy is still a little bit slow, a little bit rickety, and it's hard to see really great opportunities. So people may just feel, you know, I've got a lot of demands uh, keeping the rest of my household in order. And why not just kind of move into a little bit more of a glide mode? So for people who've got steady jobs, their desire is, I just want to stay put for a little bit. Because this, this trend runs counter to what I'm actually going to speak with Susan for McKenzie about later in the show, which is a lot of people are having to switch industries during this time. They don't have the, the liberty, if you will, to shelter in jobs. So what's the dichotomy there? So we actually see both of those things happening. And uh, what we've been discussing so far is people who are in steady jobs. We also did a breakout looking at people who want to switch jobs. And in some cases, they're outright unemployed. In other cases, they've got limited work hours or they feel they could get a better situation. And that's kind of where ambition is concentrated now. So in that group, we saw a lot more desire to, you know, either take on more learning, switch industries, but it's as if the economy is split in two. The big half is the people who are sort of sheltering in place. The smaller group is the people who don't have the luxury of doing that. And they're ready to mobilize to do something different. And in terms of these people who are sheltering in job right now, were there any aspirational reasons that they were doing it other than just the steady paycheck and the comfort of knowing that you have employment during this pandemic? Uh, it was much more of a, a, you know, settle into where we are kind of situation. Uh, so we did ask, uh, you know, questions about, uh, you know, connecting with friends, uh, education, aspiration, desire to get promoted. Interestingly, the higher responses we saw on those came from our Black and Hispanic respondents. There was more of a desire to step up there uh, for the white respondents, sort of more of a, let's just stay where we are. Yeah, let's take a look at how the responses differed from a racial perspective, because those findings were particularly interesting. This is what we got in the terms of the report right here. Talk to us a little bit about these differences and, and, and any gleanings from them. Yeah, so what we're looking at here is the level of people that truly enjoy the nature of the work they do. Um, white respondents were the highest on that at 47%, a little bit above the overall average of 45%. Um, and as you can see, Asian, Black, and Hispanic respondents were all a bit lower. Black respondents had, uh, had the lowest level, 29%, uh, saying they truly enjoy the nature of the work they're doing. And George, Workforce Confidence Report, it comes out every week. Any any interesting gleanings from this, this report other than what we discussed? Uh, so the big two that we discussed were, you know, for people in their job, uh, sheltering in job, uh, for job seekers, one of the things we found that was interesting in the job seeker community is a high desire to go their own way. And that could mean starting a business or that could mean trying the freelance world. We've already seen data coming out of the federal government saying that new business formation is up so uh, America's entrepreneurial spirit is kindling at the edges, and it's always going to be the people who are dissatisfied for whom the regular work experience isn't succeeding 
who are going, you know what, I could do better if I set up my own business. So th that's one of the most optimistic and encouraging things is the sense that out of the mess that we've had the past year, we're going to see a lot of people starting new businesses, and hopefully some of those will really take off. George, can you hear me now? Now I can hear you, yes. All right, I'm unable to hear George, so I'm not sure if there's something going on with my mic over here. All right. All right, George, it was wonderful hearing from you. Of course, we love all of your insights with the workforce report and we'll see you again soon. Terrific, take care. That was difficulties, but we appreciate him. We appreciate him joining us. Oh, it looks like I am having some audio difficulties. All right, can you hear me now? <laughs> All right, as I was saying, that was George Anders, senior editor at large for us here at LinkedIn. And to catch the Workforce Confidence Index from his profile, be sure to follow him on LinkedIn and hit subscribe for more insights like these. The COVID-19 job market has disrupted industries as well as changed how workers are feeling about their jobs. But how much of this is short-term adjustments versus long-term impacts? That's exactly what McKinsey Global Institute sought to understand this morning. The firm released a major report with then Doug with what work looks like in a post-COVID world. Joining me now to discuss is Susan Loon. She's a partner at McKinsey as well as a co-author of the report. Susan, I hope you can hear me and I can hear you. I can hear you. So. That's All, right. All right, perfect. Well, let's start with this report. It was quite expansive, and we have a lot of partners right now looking and gleaning insights into what the world of work is going to look like moving forward. What was the goal with this specific study? So we were looking long term. How much of what the pandemic has changed will stick after the economy reopens, and how will it change the trajectory of work over the next decade? And there's a, there's a lot of chatter about this right now in terms of how much remote work is going to be a part of the working world moving forward. Is this something that's going to stick? And if so, to what extent? So in the report, we look at three broad groups of trends. One is remote work and virtual meetings. The second group is e-commerce and the delivery economy. And then the third set of trends is around automation and AI. So going with remote work, um, Many companies, so in a survey that, that we did, 72% of companies said they're currently planning some form of hybrid remote work after the pandemic. Now, this typically means a day or two a week from home and then some days in the office, as opposed to 100% remote. But companies are really thinking about reimagining how and where work gets done when we can all go back, rather than just going back to the way things were. I think that a lot of people have found that they enjoy foregoing the commute and having more time at home. And companies have found that actually people, in many cases, are working longer hours. Um, and so it's been more productive than I think skeptical executives would have thought. For all those reasons, um, we did an analysis of, well, how much work could really be done from home? And we found that it's definitely concentrated among office workers, but around, you know, 20 to 25 percent of people in advanced economies like the United States could work from home three to five days a week. And I want to say hello to some members who are joining us in the stream, Susan. We have Amet from Turkey, Jacqueline in New York City. Diana in Texas, Matthew from Colorado, and Vince in California. Thanks for joining us on LinkedIn News Live. Let's talk about this concentration of, if you really look at the data, how much people could potentially work from home and remain productive. We actually have a graph that I want to bring up right now where we can show you exactly the top professions that right now are, yep, here we go, the sectors with the highest potential for remote work, finance and insurance, management, professional, scientific, and technical services. Susan, when I saw this in the report, 76, 86 percent of the time. Is, is that true that, that these that some of these workers can spend working from home? It is true, because when you think about the work that gets done, a lot of it is working by yourself on a computer and that can be done anyway, anywhere. So the things that really benefit from being in person are critical decision meetings, negotiations, bringing on new employees and onboarding them. Um, brainstorming and innovation. But when we looked at the time spent um, in different occupations in these sectors, what we found is that people are spending a lot of time 
working on their computer by themselves. And that can be done from anywhere. <laughs> I'm laughing because I spend a lot of time working from home now on my computer by myself as well. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not in one of these industries. So this has to change the geography of how we work. I think about New York City, where, I, where our offices are in the Empire State Building, all those floors filled with all those workers, all that land space in terms of work that we're devoting to offices. What did the report find in terms of how that's going to change? Well, there are indications that many companies are thinking that if they're going to have, say, 20 to 30 percent of the workforce at home on any given day, that over time they're going to reduce their office footprint. Now, that's not necessarily um, going to happen, but we certainly see some evidence that that's how companies are thinking. We also see evidence that um, when we look at residential rents, people are moving out of San Francisco and New York and Washington DC where I live and into either suburbs or into other parts of the country like Austin, Texas and Denver and Las Vegas. Um, we can also see an office vacancy rates. Vacancy rates are way up in the city centers of the most expensive coastal cities, uh, but they're actually declining a bit in some of the smaller cities um, in the middle of the US. So whether this shift not only out of city centers to more suburban locations, but even further afield to, you know, let's go to Boise, Idaho, or wherever you want to live, uh, whether that continues, we're going to have to watch over this next year as people do go back to the office. And are you seeing any insights yet from executives, from corporate leaders who do have these big footprints on the coast? Are they worried about these migrations? It seems like a boon for places like you say, Boise, Idaho, but execs who have these footprints well established, what are they thinking right now? So companies are starting to embrace the fact that people might be working in different places. So many companies are thinking about, should we set up a satellite office in Austin or Boise or Detroit? Um, in addition, companies are realizing that they can meet maybe uh, a goal of broadening the talent pool because all the best talent doesn't necessarily live in a high cost places. Um, and they might be able to meet more of their diversity goals uh, by setting up in a more diverse range of cities across the United States. So a lot of companies are really embracing this idea and thinking about maybe the office of the future or the company of the future will have a headquarter, but it could have satellite offices all over the place. And we actually have a question here in the stream, Susan, from Rosa, who wants to know, as, as we're talking about the, the footprint that com companies will have moving forward, will climate change affect any of these predictions? Well, that's a great question. So over the course of the last year, we saw that rather than forgetting about their climate and environmental impact goals, Companies, if anything, seem more focused on that. And they're reporting their carbon footprint and emissions. And working from home um, does reduce emissions. Even more important is the impact on business travel. So by doing virtual meetings, uh, many people think that business travel will be lower than it was before the pandemic. Um, the travel and logistics practice at McKinsey has estimated that 20% of business travel may never return. So there were internal meetings or kind of routine sales meetings that now will be replaced by Zoom and Teams and other digital platforms. And that would all um, also help companies meet their environmental goals. But Susan, is that really true? I'm married to a consultant who prior to the pandemic was on a plane every Monday and every Thursday. I'm speaking to someone from McKinsey right now. I'm skeptical. Is it true that there are this well-established industries where business travel was a key part of how they thought about business? That's it's going to change. Well, okay, now we're into the realm of personal opinion, but yes, I think it will. And I can't tell you the hundreds of executives I've heard over the last year say, you know, the days when I would get on an airplane to fly somewhere for a one-hour meeting are over. Now, certainly it's not to say there will be lots of travel, but like I said, on the margins, there was, let me call it low-value travel or travel for internal company meetings that really can be done equally effectively over Zoom. That said, people are still going to want to meet with clients. There will be business conferences, um, but I think it's a matter of on the margin there's a lot of activities where we flew around without thinking about it. And now we realize that these digital platforms work really well. 
Well, I'm sure it's a relief to my husband who's joining us right now. And I'm sure many in the stream that hopefully the travel all day for the one hour meeting is a trend that we can say goodbye to after COVID-19. Saying hello to some more members who are joining us from the stream. We have Portia from South Africa, Gail and Richard who are in Michigan, Henrik from Brazil, Kenneth in Florida, Matthew from Illinois, and Sarah in Washington. Thanks for joining us on LinkedIn News Live. I'm here with Susan Loon. She's with McKinsey, and we're talking all things future of work. So if you have questions of what your work life is going to look like post-COVID-19, I'm sure Susan doesn't have all the answers, but she has many based on a new report that McKinsey just put out this morning. Susan, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about job shifting. Of course, industries are transforming during this pandemic, so workers are having to adapt. What are we seeing? So one of the big findings of our report is that a lot of the new behaviors that we adopted over the last year are going to stick. Remote work is one, but the shift to digital channels, online apps, e-commerce, and then the use of robotics to reduce distance and proximity, sorry, to increase distance, but reduce proximity to other people in places like retail stores and food service restaurants, those things are going to stick. And what it means is that over the next uh, um, 10 years, we could see a lot less demand um, in a lot of frontline service jobs like retail clerks, food service workers, hospitality workers. And that means that people currently in those roles, many of them are gonna have to find different occupations. Uh, and that's a big shift. Right, and, and the report found that almost all employment growth would be in, in high wage jobs, which obviously means a lot to frontline workers who are going to have to reskill. What's what's that? What's happening there in terms of how we're thinking about reskilling moving forward? Well, it's going to become more important than ever. So, in the past, there was a well known phenomenon called the polarization of work, where we saw growth in high wage jobs and then a decline in a lot of middle wage jobs, many in manufacturing and some office types of jobs. But then there was a lot of growth in personal services and low wage jobs. Looking at the decade ahead, because of the huge increase in use of digital channels and automation, we may not see that growth in low wage jobs. So it means not only that there are more people that may need to find a new occupation, but this the jump that they're gonna have to make to get jobs that are higher wages, which is good news, um, is going to be larger. They're going to need really a very different set of skills than what they have today. Well, speaking of those skills, we have a question from Ryan in New York who's asking, if the job growth will be in high-wage jobs, what should people at the beginning of their career look to do to prepare for that? Well, I think one critical thing is everyone in a country like in Europe or the United States needs some kind of post-secondary skill. Now, it doesn't mean everyone has to go to college or even go get a two-year associate's degree, but you need some kind of credential. So whether it's through an apprenticeship, a coding boot camp, a short-term program, people need a skill because there are a lot of career pathways available in healthcare, in technology, in, in transportation, business services, but it's gonna be critical for young people to think about what kind of marketable skill do they have. That's the first thing. And the second thing I'd say is that you should plan on your career being really varied over the course of your lifetime, rather than starting one job and staying there for decades, you'll probably start in one occupation and over time migrate into different types of work as demand changes. And, and Susan, I wanted to ask you this report, like all of McKinsey's reports, excuse me, it was very expansive. I think it was over 150 pages and you've been doing this type of research for quite some time. What stood out to you the most about this report and that you think the members in the stream should know about? What stood out to me the most was that COVID will have a very uneven impact on the future of work. Um, as we look at the economic recovery, some of you may have heard the term the K-shaped recovery, and that means tech sectors like technology and pharmaceuticals are doing great while air travel is, is you know, doing poorly. And the same is going to be true in uh, the recovery for jobs, that there are lots of people who are in jobs that really weren't that impacted. So when you think about all the outdoor work, like construction, farm, even transportation drivers, you know, their jobs have continued largely the same and will. All of the impact is being concentrated 
on the occupations where people are working in close physical proximity to other people. So think about the retail cashier or the, uh, the server in a restaurant. And those are the places because of this now, you know, we're at a year long pandemic, um, companies and consumers have started to expect different things. Customers don't want to interact with people and companies have tried to keep their workforce safe by spacing people out and using technology in different ways to achieve that. So it's going to be really uneven, I think, on what the future looks like. Well, Susan, there are a lot of people speculating on what the future is gonna look like both on and off LinkedIn. And we appreciate you bringing these data-driven insights to the conversation. As always, a pleasure to sit down with you. Thank you. That was Susan Lund, a partner at McKinsey, walking us through their latest research on what the workforce is going to look like post-COVID-19. All right, tomorrow my colleague Andrew Seaman will be with you for a conversation with BJ Fogg. He's the director of Stanford's Behavior Design Lab. They'll be talking all things jobs, as always, as we discuss on Get Hired at 12 Eastern tomorrow, Friday. I'm Caroline Fairchild. Thanks for joining us on LinkedIn News Live.